Okay, so I will make it into a bigger size. Is that okay? Ah, uh, yes, yes, fine. All right. So, as I told you, teaching for excellence is what I'm going to talk about. Let us see the next slide, which says the points to be discussed. Now, I thought these four points we can discuss in great detail. Please feel free to ask questions if you want. But then we must remember that when we ask a question just now, it is only an intellectual interaction. You know, we are looking at our minds and then we are interacting. But that is not really good because these are all experiential evaluations. We should experience first. So look at all these points, you know, try to recollect as I'm speaking to you, try to recollect your teaching experience. Try to remember as a teacher, what all you did in these areas. Did you have some experience of this nature? Or in future, what are you going to do in order to bring about this excellence? So the first slide, I thought we could discuss some evaluation tools. Now, how do you measure excellence? You know, we can measure height and weight because measurements are there, instruments are there. If you want to measure your, uh, you know, blood samples or your x-rays, all these are there, machines are there, but we don't have a machine for excellence. Let us remember that when we are talking about excellence, we have to depend on parameters which we ourselves build up. We need to find these measurements. We cannot depend on a measurement which is available because such a machine to analyze the teaching learning excellence has not been discovered yet. Then we will talk about the traits of excellence. What would really be excellence when we are talking about the teacher and the learner? What is it that, you know, remember that if we want to pass anything to our student, we have to practice it first ourselves. Suppose I want to teach English, I need to learn English. You know, I'm an English teacher. Therefore, I need to know English in order to teach English. If my English is non-existent, what will I teach? Like that, the traits of excellence would imply that we are able to tell the student that excellence which is within ourselves. So we have to see the traits of excellence. What are the qualities which we bring into the teaching learning in order to make the communication excellent? Now, in this FDP, I'm sure all of you are getting a lot of technical lectures. In each of these technical lectures, the aim is to bring out the excellence in you. You know, bring out whatever is very good. So we need to measure with, you know, evaluation tools. When I'm teaching this subject, am I doing a proper job? To inculcate this excellence, do I have the qualities? Then the student gets the benefit. Then we come to the third point and that is value education. We are talking in terms of value education today because everybody says that, you know, we should bring a subject value education into our curriculum. Where I taught, that is Osmania University, Hyderabad, there was always this talk of having an extra subject value education, another extra subject, gender sensitization, also value education, because gender sensitization is about values. All these things, we have to learn how to integrate. You know, it is not something which is outside. It is something which has to be integrated into whatever subject we might be teaching. Otherwise, separately, it cannot be done. So we will see how values can be brought into the practical sphere. Look at the world today or look at our country today or look at our you know, own cities today. What we have is a lot of conflict. What we have is a lot of negatives. The only way to remove this is to bring in positive values. The pandemic has given us a lot of opportunities because this was a crisis situation. Could we learn something from it? That is to bring values to practical life, not necessarily in a lecture itself. 
That is why I told you that I'm not talking to you as such. I'm trying to, you know, make your mind active towards research into <clears throat> the concept of excellence. We have to remember that. Then finally, you know, I have taken one quotation of Swami Vivekananda, which is about education. About 125 years ago, he said, what kind of education do we want? That means excellent education. So what is a complete education which we want? So we will analyze in four points, we will analyze this. These are the slides which I wanted to share with you. I will share my ideas about each of the points which I have mentioned in the slides. But remember that my ideas are only limited to one person's experience. We don't want only one person's experience. We want the experience of the number of participants, the number of teachers who are here with us. Each one of us has valuable experience. We have to translate that experience into excellence. That is the idea which I want to, you know, right from the first sentence which I uttered, I want you all to start thinking. Listening is one channel. You know, here two channels are active. One is your mind is listening. The other is your mind is checking up your own experiences or checking up what I can do about these things. It is not only a passive listening, which I would like, because I'm not telling you something which is very great or, you know, which is something you cannot think of. Please be totally interactive with your mind and with the ideas which I'm sharing. Now we come to this evaluation tool. Now, when we are talking about evaluation tools, I have mentioned four stories. I think somebody's uh, audio is on. I would request all the participants to switch off their audio because otherwise there is an echo and others might not be able to hear. In case you have problems with my audio, please send a message in the chat box. I'm sure the organizers will let me know. Okay, now let me continue. Ma'am, I will take it, ma'am. Uh, I will. Okay. okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Now we come to this idea oh, of. Unmute when you can. Please not chat with me. I'm a lady on there. Somebody shall unmute the audio of the situation. Should I continue? Yes, ma'am, please continue. Audio is clear? Yes, yes, madam, yes, madam. Okay. So we have now, I have identified four tools. Please understand that these are not everything. You can identify your own evaluation tools as you go ahead in excellence. Let us remember that excellence doesn't come in a minute. It's not like something, you know, you say that, okay, I'm taking one tablet morning and one tablet evening. By tomorrow, my fever is fine. That means I've become excellent. That is not how it helps. We go on practicing. We go on getting experience of teaching and then we get better. So the point here is that the first evaluation tool is what we are teaching. Is it practical or is it theoretical? Many of us teach, especially since you are in a technical institution, I can tell you this example that, you know, many of our technical qualified people are going all over the world now. When they go to another country, they are told that their theory is very good. Their knowledge is very good but their ability to work with that theory is non-existent. They don't have the practical skills. They don't have application and theory is good. So we need application. In whatever subject we are teaching, application is most important because a student comes and tells me that I can write very good English. I got 90 marks in English, but I can't speak one sentence in English. Of course, they tell me in Telugu, not in English. So you can imagine that they have the knowledge of the language. 
They're able to write it, but they're not able to practically use the language in oral communication. This example I gave you from my own subject. I would like you to think of your own subject. Are you giving your students or have, were you given when you were a student this ability to use the knowledge? The knowledge is usable. The story might be familiar to all of you that you know the scholar was going on a, in a boat and scholars, as we all know, have a habit of bragging by saying, okay, I'm so great, I'm so-and-so. Then what happens? The scholar has read a lot of books. He keeps asking the boatman, have you read anything? The boatman is illiterate. He says, no, I haven't read anything. Uh, when a storm comes, the boatman says, do you know how to swim? Scholar says, don't worry. I know I have read so many books on swimming. The boatman says, it's not the books that matter here. Do you know how to swim? So without any theory, the boatman is able to save himself. The scholar with all learning is not able to save himself. This idea is what we have to see. You know, if life experiences we take, our students going into a real life situation, how will they feel when they are talking about this idea? And the idea is practical implementation, application, rather than only theoretical knowledge. This is what we need to analyze first. So this is one measurement, you know, I've given one scale. Now we can measure ourselves. When we go to the next class, we measure. Whatever I have taught today, how is it? Have the students benefited practically? Tomorrow, will they be able to use it? I'm told that many people are there, you know, uh, uh, maybe civil engineers they are called, I assume. When they finish, they don't know how to construct anything. They have no idea at all, but they have read big books of civil engineering. They have done a lot of work, hard work, but they are not able to do what is expected of them. Now, if this is what is happening, then we have to be very, very careful about this point. Now, the second measurement, the second parameter, which I'm talking about here, is the courage of conviction. I remember once in NIT, I was speaking to a group of computer science teachers. NIT is a wonderful institution. They had organized this program, maybe people from all over India were there. And then they were talking about, you know, I was telling them about how a good teacher really performs. They said, no, we don't want to perform like that because we are just waiting for the economy to pick up so that we get jobs in the IT field. Teaching is not our profession. So are we into this profession half-heartedly? Are we convinced that what we are doing is a life-changing experience? Many people have problems with teaching. They say, oh, we do not get any benefits. Oh, we do not get this or that. For such a person, this is not a profession because teaching has to be your passion. For your excellence, you have to believe in what you are saying. You know, that is what is the courage of conviction. If you teach a subject, you must have full faith that the subject which you're teaching is going to make life beneficial, successful, you know, meaningful for the student. Unless we are able to do this, we are no teachers at all. So that is an evaluation tool number two. Here again, I'm telling you a story. And this story is the story of a teacher again. You know, the teacher in the morning needs a cup of tea. So the teacher tells the milkmaid, why do you come late every day? I get late for my class if you come late because I need to drink tea. This little girl who comes you know, from very far off, she says that you know, I'm not able to come because I have to cross the river and the boatman comes late, so I get late. Now the teacher, as many of us do, you know, to make a point, to make very stressful point, we say that you can walk on water if you have faith 
you can walk on water, then you won't be late. Now this little girl thinks, oh, that's wonderful. I will walk on water. We say, you know, in our culture that faith moves mountains. Human beings all say this. So from the next day, she comes on time. And the teacher is very impressed. Says, oh, so you're coming on time these days. How is it that you're managing to come on time? He says, sir, you told me to walk on the water. I'm walking. Now the teacher thinks, what rubbish. How can anybody be walking on water? So he says, show me, show me. And he goes, you know, there is no solution for doubt. When he gets a doubt, he says, oh, I'm such a great person. Ego, human ego is uncontrollable. We all know that. So I'm such a great person. Therefore, let me start walking on water. Unfortunately, when he enters the water, he holds up his dress. You know, the, believing that the water is water, not believing that the water is a you know, steady road. So where the girl is able to go across the river, the scholar, the, the teacher drowns. These are all metaphoric stories, please remember. These are not real stories. They are only for us to keep in mind the measurement. You know, if I just give the measurement, nobody will remember. Nobody will think about it. But when we go into the class and make a statement, which is only for in impression and not for a real commitment, then what happens? We don't believe in what we are saying. Imagine as a teacher, very often we say, start studying from the first day of the semester. An intelligent student might ask us, Madam, did you study when you were a student? Did you study from the first day of the semester? Good question. You know, we very often we make statements which we have not implemented, which we have not done, and which we don't also believe in. We just make it for effect. That is not allowed. For excellence, this is an evaluation tool that you have a conviction you have a faith and you have the courage to implement that faith. Very often there are arguments in the classroom, but a teacher who is, has the courage or a student who has the courage is able to share their viewpoint. Otherwise what happens is a student asks, teacher gets angry. The teacher gives a half answer, students get angry. This is what happens very often. The conflict is resolved when the teacher is able to give that relationship, that equation, which is beyond the answer to the question only. It is that which is important. You know, you show by your actions, you show by your attitudes that you are reliable, that a student can depend on your conviction, that you have the courage to uphold these convictions. Very often we have wrong ones. As teachers, we are supposed to be role models. That is what Gandhiji says very beautifully. But we, instead of being role models, we are still trying to make ourselves better. This is where the problem arises, that we require betterment, we require change. Only the change required is that we need to do some self-introspection. This entire session, I hope, will lead all of us to introspect. Because after finishing a one hour lecture or a one hour class, we need to immediately look within by saying, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? What did I do right and what did I not do right? Courage of conviction. Conviction is I want to become better. You know, I'm very old, I'm retired. I don't need to become better. But till the last breath of our life, we need to become better. And that is why the courage of conviction is important. As I was giving you the example of the pandemic, you know, in March, I didn't know how to use all these online platforms. In the 1st of April, a young boy taught me, that young boy is an engineer. And he said, Madam, don't worry, I will tell you, you do little by little. And from April, I must have done hundreds of lectures because I learned it recently. In my old age, I could learn. 
So all of us can learn, you know, 70, 80 year old people are learning things. It is not that the human brain is not capable of it. This we have to remember when we are talking about this tool number two. So we are measuring again, you know, do I have that faith? When I'm telling you about excellence, do I really believe in excellence? Have I displayed this excellence in my life? Otherwise I have no business to come and waste your time. Two hours of your life I'm taking away. Do I have that? I must have the courage that yes, all my life, my 40 years of teaching career, I have striven towards excellence. Achieving is not in our hands, but striving is in our hands. Walking is in our hands, you know, progress. Step by step, we are going forward. This is what we need to think about. Now, the next point is about the learner. That is the learner's commitment. Very often, if you ask students, I remember, you know, very often, we have too many engineering colleges in Hyderabad. Very often in their programs, I would get questions from students by saying, my parents have forced me to do this course. I don't want to do this course. Now, what should I do? Imagine you are doing something, no commitment. Sometimes the students come to the university. You say, why did they, you join the university? Are you not interested in the course? They said, no, no, we want only hostel. You know, our university is more than 100 years old, beautiful hostels, everything. So is it not that we are not going to the path of commitment? If I join a course, I must do the course very well. If I do something, it must be done to the best of my ability, not half-heartedly, not the take it easy kind of thing, which we find, you know, in students often. So we have to change that perception. We have to tell them without saying, be committed, be committed, nobody listens. We have to show them what is commitment. We have to tell them the importance to their life if they are committed today. Again, a story. I'm, I'm just using these stories to make you, you know, to keep it in your mind. I remember many points, you know, hearers don't remember. But it's, when it's in the form of a story, the story somewhere sticks to the mind. And then the tool arrives. You know, the tool arrives only when you have this comparison, the comparison of the story. So the student goes to the teacher's house, like I was mentioning you, uh, mentioning to you the gurukula. So the gurukula is there. The student comes and says, I want to study. Very good. Come and stay with me. He starts staying with the teacher. The teacher doesn't teach anything. Now, the student thinks maybe the teacher doesn't know anything. Why no teaching, no classes going on as now? Then one day the teacher says, come, let's have a bath. You know, then bathing in the river before the course starts, before starting anything good in our culture, we always go for a bath. So the student is fairly excited. He says, okay, my course is finally going to begin because we are going for the bath. Now, as soon as they reach the river, they get into the river, the teacher holds the student's neck and pushes the student inside the water. Now the student is struggling, you know, trying to come out of the water, trying to say, oh my God, the teacher doesn't know anything. And now the teacher is trying to kill me also, imagine. Finally, the teacher lets go and he takes a huge deep breath. The teacher says, how did you feel? The student is, you know, very upset. Says, oh, I felt terrible. I felt as though I needed to breathe. Unless I took the next breath, my life was finished. That is how I felt. Now the teacher asked the question, do you feel like that about education? Have you come here only just like that casually because somebody told you, you should be educated? Or do you feel that desperation you felt for oxygen in your body, that desperation in your mind for education? And you see now the parameter, 
we have to get the students to that state of commitment. Very often you will find that some students are very fond of some teacher, some students are fond of some other teacher. They like that subject also because of the teacher. All these things are because you are somehow bringing the student's commitment into play. Some students are good. You know, you have the good variety in every class, but you have also the mischievous variety in every class who forget to make mischief and are totally concentrated if we are able to give them that ability, you know, that ability which tells them that whatever job they are doing, they must do with their full energy. If they are playing in the playground, full energy. If they are searching, you know, uh, their social media for messages and chats, full energy, full commitment. When they are eating their dinner, they shouldn't be watching television. This is not commitment. You are not enjoying your food. You're not enjoying the program. So what are you committed to? Which of them are you committed to? Then you are depriving the other thing which you are doing. So that kind of multitasking is not good at all. We don't require those kind of things. Therefore, learner's commitment has to come. You know, parents also have a role in this. Teachers have a role in this, especially not so much college teachers as, you know, teachers in schools and lower classes have this because you have to get them involved. The student who might be misbehaving in your class is usually a very intelligent student. That student gets bored and therefore creates problems. We have to keep this in mind that we are not able to engage the student's mind. That is why the mind wanders. So again, we come to the concept of excellence. Now we come to the fourth story, very popular story of, you know, Nachiketa from the Upanishads, which says that, you know, you learn from life. Here the story is the story of material prosperity. The father of Nachiketa is very rich, but he is only giving gifts which are useless. Not giving gifts which are good, you know, which are valuable. Giving all gifts which are useless. Nachiketa says, this is terrible, you know, you should be giving the best because you're giving gifts. He says, okay, give. I, you're my son. I gift you off to the Lord of Death. So Nachiketa goes, you know, to the world where Yama lives and he's not there. Now Yama comes back and the, he tries to tempt him by saying, I'll give you riches, I'll give you power, I'll give you position, I'll give you prosperity, material prosperity, everything. This young boy doesn't want any of those things. He says, I have seen material prosperity is no way of becoming you know, enlightened, no way of becoming realized. So if you want to make something out of life, then I want that life experience. I want that real experience, which gives value and meaning to me. Now, we are not able to bring this into our curriculum. You know, we are restricted to our syllabus. I'm sure as teachers, all of you know, that there is a difference between syllabus and curriculum. The syllabus is the actual lessons, the actual topics, and curriculum is the ideal behind it. The curriculum for engineering or technology will be that they will become superior or excellent technical persons. That is the ideal. But to be an excellent technical person, you have to also be a good human being. If you are not a good human being, you don't have the right values, all your technical expertise will not benefit. I'm sure you know the story of the first atomic explosion where the scientist was reciting shlokas from the Bhagavad Gita. You know, American scientists, not Indian scientists. You know, like a million sons and so on. That is there in the Bhagavad Gita. So what are they doing? They are discovering a you know, life-threatening bomb and they are quoting scriptures. You can, you know, we used to teach that the devil quotes scriptures. Soon after this, 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki had such a terrible thing. Today we know we are talking about biological warfare, we are talking about warfare through viruses and so on. So it's a very crisis-filled world, the crisis resulting from educated people. Please understand, the illiterate are not bringing us these crises. It is the educated people who are bringing us. So for education, we need to understand that this material prosperity is only limited. Okay, you need a good house, you need a car, you need an AC, you need comfort, you need good food. Okay, you need that level you need, but you don't need more than that. There is a difference between need and greed. You know, many of us are not showing this difference because colleges and universities are now bragging only about the pay package. You say, oh, the passing out group of students have got so many placements with such high pay package. So my college rank becomes very high because they have got lakhs and lakhs of uh, you know, pay package or millions and millions of pay package, the young students, the just pass outs from your college. So is that the way of looking at life? You have a lot of money. Then why are you so maladjusted in life? You have everything. Then why are you going in the wrong path? So each of us needs to, I have spent a lot of time on evaluation tools because each of us has to measure ourselves all the time, every day. Now we move on to the next slide. Uh, let me try to get the next slide. Please give me a moment. <clears throat> Now we come to traits for excellence. So when we are talking about traits of excellence, I will again share that uh, slide. Sorry. Okay, is it? It's, it is not visible. It's not visible. Oh, just wait, I will try to. Anyway, if it creates a problem, then you know the audio is good enough. Yes, yes, madam. Yes. Uh, Yes, now it is visible. Okay, now it's visible. I'm not going into the big size. I hope this is visible to everybody. Yes, and the print is clear so that I don't have to go into the slideshow mode, then it is not moving. Okay, so what are the traits of excellence? You know, we have four levels of excellence, which I have in, used here. Level number one is how we approach the teaching learning process. Some teacher would only give information. You know, that is a basic level. A slightly higher level of teaching would be that you persuade. You know, the students are not willing to study. They don't believe what you're saying. So you try to persuade by saying, this is useful for you. This is important for you and so on. A higher level is negotiate. You know, you know a part of the lesson, the student with all the help of Google, etc., knows a lot of information. So you are willing to share. You are willing to participate with each other. That is negotiate. But the highest level of excellence is inspire. The teaching of the teacher inspires the student. The student's behavior as a learner inspires the teacher to teach well. I'm sure in your physical classroom, you have experienced this, that when you have a very interested group of students, you teach in a different, a higher, a better style. 
If you have a group of students who are all yawning and sleeping, your teaching style becomes less, you know, better. I mean, it is not so good. So you can imagine how much impact there is on each of us. The student on the teacher, the teacher on the student. In fact, the greatest research in the world, you will remember, is done by classroom teachers. You know, all the great research books, all the great research findings which you come across are all done by people who have seen the response of their students and they have found these. So this four step idea of the trait is important. So when next time we go into class, we should say, am I doing only information part? Am I just finishing the syllabus and coming out? Okay, that is only a teacher who informs. Then, you know, am I telling a student, oh, sir, I hate your subject. I don't hey, like it. Madam, I don't like this lesson which you're teaching. Persuade. You know, this is very significant. This can be learned like this, which is like a game. You know, you play some game and then you make the lesson so interesting. Negotiate. You know what you said? I, I, I have understood differently. I have read up differently. I have said this. I have understood this. Okay. This, you give a student the chance to, you know, identify what they have read, what they have spoken, you know, in the class. You share your knowledge and you give them a chance. This becomes a wonderful way of encouraging students. And then, of course, inspire. I don't think I need to go into details. We all know in our own lives, some teachers inspired us. Our students come and tell us whom we have inspired. And the greatest reward a teacher can get is that inspiration. 20 years later, some student comes and says, oh, madam, I remember you. Oh, sir, I remember you. This is a great reward. We don't need, you know, our salary, our fine, uh, you know, uh, perks cannot measure with the joy you feel when you inspire. And this inspiration lasts forever. So that is one level of measuring excellence. These traits we need to cultivate. That is the ability to inspire. Then we have another step. Some teachers say, like the information part I told you, some, you know, only tell, say, or tell, they describe, they explain. Their explanation is excellent. They give so many examples and explain. Everybody has understood, but that understanding is only of the brain. It doesn't go inside. It doesn't retain. You ask a student after the semester exam, they say, oh, we forgot. We wrote that in the semester exam. Now we have forgotten. So it doesn't go in. What you have to do is show. Now, those of your subjects which have practicals, show is wonderful. But a subject like mathematics has no practicals. Can you not show? You can. A language like English has no practicals. Can we not show? We can. So this show is not necessarily in the lab. The greatest laboratory is the mind of the teacher and the student. The greatest chemical is the interaction. Unless we are able to do this, we cannot really show. And then, of course, the higher level is a sign. Don't do everything yourself. Do it also. Make the student participate so that the student also is doing a lot of work. Share your work. Share the you know, burden of teaching like they have in the best universities of the world, they have something called teaching assistants. These teaching assistants are people who are themselves students. So that is assigning. You can assign. Their assigning implies teamwork between the teacher and the student. So we are merging our capabilities. We are merging our energies and we are coming to a level of excellence. <coughs> Now we have the third one. I have already mentioned syllabus oriented. We often do this, you know, finishing the syllabus. Teacher oriented, you know, please depend on me. Whatever I'm telling you is the gospel truth. 
Don't go outside whatever I'm telling you. This is wrong. You know, the teacher earlier, you know, we have names like professor or such things. That is only for a mechanical job of teaching. That is not really a nice thing to do because that is a teacher-oriented classroom. Very often, they said, make it learner-oriented. You know, we have to see that the students get a lot of role in the classroom. That's wonderful. We say, oh, syllabus will not finish if the students are given role. But suppose you have to teach a topic today. You tell them the day before by saying, tomorrow I'm going to do this topic. You read up and come. Periodically, you stop your explanation and say, now who can supplement what I have said? Are you not involving the learner? The learner is well read. Many teachers feel threatened by saying, whatever I'm going to teach, if they already know, then they will not listen to me. That is not the correct thing. The correct is to challenge their knowledge, to challenge their mind, to make them come up with newer innovations, newer ideas. That is the learner orientation. Many students do not follow this because they are worried about the exam. You know, those three hours decide their life or those two hours decide their life. That is not correct because a student who gets 90 in the exam might fail in life. A student who's getting only 50, 60 in the exam is successful in life. So we have to remember that exam is not everything. These are, we have to mix all this. I'm not saying anyone should be discarded. Please understand. I'm not saying that syllabus should be discarded, exam should be discarded, teaching should be discarded. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we have to put them all in a balanced perspective. There should be such a balance that we don't have the ability to you know, differentiate them and follow only one method. If we follow all of them in a little by little, keeping them in a right proportion, then it becomes useful. Job-oriented education, we have the classroom, you know, you are only teaching in such a way that finally they have an interview campus and they get a job and so on. But who is teaching life-oriented? People who are passing out from the best universities of the country or the world, who have got the best job, the best family life, everything, going and committing suicide, going and you know doing wrong things, being corrupt, killing each other, murdering the family, becoming bankrupt. We hear so many such stories. What happened to their education? Education was not for excellence because they gave a thrust on all the other points. They did not give the thrust on life orientation. Then a last trait is mentoring. You know, we have, I think now UGC might have made or AICT might have made mentoring compulsory, but there is also the possibility of voluntary mentoring. Suppose tomorrow there's an exam. Tonight at about 10 o'clock, a student calls up. He says, sir or madam, I need this help from you. <clears throat> Will you get angry? Will you th not think that a student will never disturb you late at night unless that student has some problem? Voluntary mentoring. You know, the mentor and mentee relationship is a very powerful relationship. And this we have to keep in mind because the teacher is always a mentor. Some people need mentoring, some others don't. <coughs> to realize who needs it, to give it without making them dependent on you, that is the quality of excellence. So of course, mentoring needs one whole lecture. I'm not going to do that. Now we come to value education. Now value education, as I've mentioned already, should not be a subject. It should be merging all values in core subjects, you know, point number two. This is very important because if it is taught as a separate subject, nobody pays attention. If you have engineering subjects and you know, then you have one uh, period for value education, <coughs> nobody is going to attend. They say, oh no, I would rather go and do my work for my core subjects. So the values need to be implemented in the core subjects. It cannot be a part of your syllabus. 
So a teacher's role in excellence is to integrate these values within ourselves and transmit these values without teaching them theoretically. That is important. So that is why I said in point number one, individual and collective involvement. You know, it is individual. Each teacher, each student is a custodian of values. We are the, you know, storehouse of values. But it has to be collective also, teamwork. All teachers, all students, not groupism, not politics, not conflict, but working together for values. Learning from real life experiences, I have already said, so I'm not going to go into this. Critical evaluation is very important. With Facebook today, with the social media today, we, are, we seem to be bombarded with information which we do not evaluate. As soon as a WhatsApp message comes, I forward it to 20 people. You say, oh, today my job is done. I forward it to 20. Sometimes they put pictures of temples and things and say, you forward it, otherwise terrible things will happen to you. Instead of forwarding it as a teacher, I scold that person who said it by saying that if you really have faith, then you don't do all these things which are very degrading, very demeaning for an educated person, a person who knows English, who knows social media, who knows how to forward a message, to do such a superstitious thing is terrible. They might feel I'm irreligious, but that is not true. As teachers, we have to learn from both good and bad context, you know, constructive and erroneous. These are the words I've used. Something which is very good teaches us a lesson. Something which is terrible, you know. Sometimes advertisements you see, they have wonderful advertisements sometimes. Students watch it so many times. They, they don't imbibe the value because they are looking at the ad and getting bored. They are not learning anything. Now, if it is a wrong advertisement, you know, an advertisement gives, which gives you a negative value, then also it's a wonderful learning experience it gives you excellence because you see the wrong and you correct it within yourself. This ability the student should have, this is critical evaluation. You know, what lesson to take? Youngsters are told, don't go for movies, don't watch so much TV, don't always see the you know cricket matches and so on. They feel so bored. They say, why always negatives? Don't give those negatives. You say that after so much entertainment, what is the takeaway which you have? You know, today it's a popular term, takeaway. So what is the takeaway? Takeaway is there from good, takeaway is there from bad also. Now, the last point is very important. You know, always whenever we teach anything, in our subjects we do this, but we don't do this for values. You know, everybody says, do this, be obedient, be good, speak the truth, and so on. But nobody does it in an experimental method. You know, if you look at a student who comes with the assignment, you know, suppose I gave an assignment and said, submit it on Thursday. The student comes and submits a beautiful assignment on Friday. Now, I want to teach discipline. I say, OK, I will read your assignment and I will tell you what is good and what is bad. I will give you a zero in that assignment. Now, why did I give zero? I'm going to read it anyway. I'm going to tell the student what mistakes he or she has made. I'm giving that zero to teach the lesson of discipline in an experimental way. That to be on time is discipline. To be one day late, even if you have terrible excuses, is indiscipline. So this is a value, you know, the quality of discipline is a value. Like that, we have to look for practical teaching experiences for value education. You know, not allow the, st the students to learn values from a book. That doesn't help. You tell the students, you allow the students to question you, to debate with you, to fight with you in order to inculcate a value. This becomes a very important point. Now we have a last idea. I thought, uh, that, um, you know, I could leave about half an hour for your uh, questions. We are supposed to finish at 3.30. It is 2.31 now. 
if you have more questions, I'll finish early. If you have many comments, I would welcome them because what I want in such a session is sharing of your experiences based on all the measurements I gave you. Suppose for each of these, you can share an experience of the classroom, I would be very happy. You know, just a couple of months back, sitting in India, I was doing a session for teachers in Malaysia. They said, Madam, give a quiz. I said, they're all teachers, why should I give a quiz? I'll give them a real experiential question. Then I told them that I told you this, this, this point. Now give one example from your real teaching experience and the best three people will get the rewards. You know, those organizers, they had some awards also for them. So you won't believe the kind of beautiful examples they gave of their real life teaching. And this was a workshop for teachers of English. So all those examples from, were from there. I'm not sharing those with you. But what I'm telling you is that, you know, the pandemic has brought us so many advantages. I'm sitting here and I'm talking to people in Chennai and different parts of the world, I assume. I have not met any of you. I have not seen any of you. What are we doing? We are trying to share our experience to learn better. You know, if all teachers put their experiences together, it becomes like a wonderful learning graph. It becomes a wonderful learning outcome because all of us cannot experience anything. We can share. So I would like to, uh, you know, hear all of you also. So if you want me to hurry up and finish, then please let me know. I hope uh, Gladys will let me know that. <coughs> yes, madam, sure. Okay. Uh, you can all put in the chat box. I'm sure she will monitor. Yes, and... I already post message. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Because no, uh, we don't want to waste your time, madam. <laughs> <coughs> very good, very good. So but if you get too many questions, you stop me. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, sure. You know, teachers are very dangerous anyway. They love to talk. So I will go on talking. And I don't want to do that. Okay, okay madam. So we have come to the last part of what I wanted to say. I, the, you know, if you, I, we have time, I will take about 20, 25 minutes on this. Otherwise, I will go very fast. This is a very famous quotation many of you might have heard. Vivekananda himself is great controversial figure today. So we don't know what to say about that. But I'm not talking about the person. I'm talking about an idea. Ideas, nobody has copyright. Look at the way in which this young man, he was just 39 when he died, <coughs> gives us a chart for excellence in education. So what does he say? He says, we want that education by which character is formed. Look at number one, character is formed. Strength of mind is increased, number two. You know, we don't find these in our syllabus or curriculum. Intellect is expanded, three. And by which one can stand on one's own feet, four. So we require four things in education. Character is formed, strength of mind is increased, intellect is expanded, and one can stand on one's own feet. This definition, very, very popular definition. He has given many hundreds of definitions I'm only talking about this one. So there are four points here. I have four slides to project for you. Each slide talking about one idea. Now the first one is, we want that education by which character is formed. So what is required? I gave you a whole you know, slide about value education. So we have some values which we call as cardinal values, although the term cardinal was used in religion earlier, but today any fixed static value we call cardinal. But these are what we call as contextual values. Look at the sixth I have put here. We need it today. In today's world, these are necessary. You know, look at, evaluate from the morning what all we did and how many negatives came to the mind. Just think for yourself. I'm not asking you to tell me. I can think of many, you know, between 5.30 when I got up to 1.30 when I started this session, many negatives came to the mind. 
what we require is the value of positivity not to rule out the negative please remember i will remind you about a black and white photograph you know when we were young there were only black and white photographs not like this you know everything is video and photo that black and white photograph had a negative you know the negative where the hair looks white and the face looks black but what would they do they would develop the negative to give you the positive so this is real life also take the negative develop it into a positive this ability this value leads to excellence leads to character formation leads a student and a teacher towards greater achievement commitment i have spoken for a long time i'm not going to mention dependability now this is very difficult you know especially in the world of today people promise many things we are doing a mooks course you know on values human excellence that will be put on the aict swam you know portal all your colleges will get it but what happens the people who are doing the lessons might take more time than they get they promise by saying madam we are going to send it on 1st of february 1st february comes and goes no response comes there are some others who if they say first they get back on first dependability you know this is a value which is very very much lacking if you ask the people who come to your college for campus interviews those companies they will tell you that the real problem in the world today is attrition attrition is you know they leave the job and they go somewhere else one year they leave again they go somewhere else and so on they say madam we spent so much time and money in recruiting within a year they leave and they go away dependability you know just a little bit of money a little facilities which are more no benefit to you as a human being except a material benefit makes you undependable so are we forming the character of this child who will tomorrow go into the ocean of the world and you know doesn't know how to swim at all then adaptability again i will tell you the pandemic example pandemic has taught us adaptability we are able to roam around wearing a mask you know we didn't know at all this i remember in classes many students from the east used to come you know from uh, philippines china japan etc they would often come to the arts college osmani university class wearing a mask so i would say what is this why do you wear this was in 2015 17 etc this a madam will be are habituated to wearing a mask now the world has become habituated how did we do it we became you know adapted adaptable not meeting each other imagine coming to gladys's college would be a different experience talking to you on this platform is a different experience altogether i'm not able to meet all of you wonderful people what happened we adapted you might all be listening i have no way of guaranteeing that everybody is listening of course no guarantee if we are physically present also because the mind is a very strange instrument but we won't go into that i'm talking about adaptability to be a good human being the quality of adaptability is important then flexibility you know if i am so old i might say whatever i know is the perfect thing when i was young it was so perfect now it is terrible but please remember every generation says that our fathers generation said it we are saying it you will say it your grandchildren will also say the same thing that ours was the best of times charles dickens said it you know so many hundreds of years ago it is the best of times it is the worst of times about the french revolution so you can imagine these things are going on we have to be flexible what i know is wonderful but i am willing to learn from others what i believe is wonderful but i cannot deny the beliefs of others i can give you here the example of religion you know all religions we are quoting vivekananda his guru says this 
Sri Ramakrishna, that all religions are different paths to the same goal. But we are fighting. We are saying, kill each other. If they don't believe in your religion, hate them. I don't know about my religion, but I hate your religion. That is our situation today. Respecting all religions, loving all religions, being faithful to your religion, that is flexibility, which we require, you know. It is very easy. Propaganda is brainwashing our youngsters. We have to ensure that we bring back those babe brains in their original, innocent, pure form. And then, of course, creativity. You must remember that today, the world is changing so fast that unless a person is creative, that person will not be able to survive. Everything as we know it is constantly changing. So we need to be creative. As a teacher, you know, you're teaching for 10 years the same syllabus. You must remember that you need to be creative in your teaching. With each new batch of students, you approach the old topic in a new way. Because for the student, it is new. It might be boring for you, but your interest comes because you are able to participate in their excitement. Now we move on to the next point, and that is strength of mind is increased. Strength of mind. These, I think, don't need much of, you know, my talking about it. Willpower. We are very vacillating. Today we believe something, tomorrow we believe something else. Today we are convinced about one thing, tomorrow we say, no, 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 that was not true at all. That is not flexibility, which I said in the earlier thing. That is indecisiveness. Look at the first and the last point, you know, decision making. Then we have concentration. When we are doing a job, do it perfectly, do it with full concentration. You know, the mental energies are all there. It is like the electrical energy. It is coming into this uh, laptop and it is charging the laptop. Now, if I cut the wire, then the energy will still be there. The electrical energy will get dispersed. It will go in all directions. That is what is happening to the mental energies. We are not putting them in one point which can get a result. We are putting them in different, different points. This ability the student needs and this ability comes from the teacher. You know, teachers have to have great concentration. I'm sure all of you know when we are teaching, there might be problems at home, there might be health issues, but when we go into the classroom, we forget the world outside. The only world is this, you know, supercomputer which is inside. And that supercomputer helps us. We can't read a book and explain in the class. We can't use class notes to explain in the class. We need to do extempore, and that is what we do. Handling change is very important. You know, like I told you, adaptability. Every change, the student who comes to college first year is very uncomfortable. You know, life in the college, life in the hostel, very uncomfortable. Same student after four years of engineering comes and cries and says, we don't want to leave this college. It's so wonderful. So we know how to handle change. Change keeps coming in life, so we have to handle it. Now in the 21st century, they say change is going to come faster and faster. So we need to get used to it. Crisis management. How do you manage your difficulties? Only with the help of your mind. So we need to give a mind training. And mind training, again, is not a separate subject. It is integrated into whatever syllabus you teach, whatever subject you teach. Now we come to intellect is expanded. After all, education is intellectual development. So we have to see that the intellect is expanded. You might have seen that, you know, all STEM courses are now getting a humanities component. They're saying that if you're learning sciences or if you're learning technology, put some, you know, human values into it. Some, you know, we have Bitspilani campus here. Long back, they started a literature course. They said, Madam, we are doing, we're giving them something like mass communication or literature or psychology or philosophy, some of the social sciences. Then it becomes a balance. Many of us know only our subject and nothing else. That is specialization. 
There was a time and specialization. You know, the 19th and the 20th centuries were very good for that. Today, it is a age of multidisciplinary research, multidisciplinary awareness. So we cannot afford to know only one subject and nothing else. The students should have capabilities. That is why they have, you know, extra credits. They can go into different disciplines. I went to Stanford University once, and then I saw, you know, that for six months, the student is allowed to attend anything. A student goes to maths, then, you know, goes to um, uh, economics, and then comes to literature, whatever they feel like. They go and attend all those classes. After that only, they decide what they want to do. They don't come already making up their minds and joining a course like we are seeing now. So this multidisciplinariness is very important for intellectual advancement, you know, expand the intellect. Critical thinking, very important skill today is critical thinking. I'm sure in an FDP, an entire session might be going devoted to critical thinking. I hope so. But all of you can do it. I have no time to go into details of critical thinking. I can give you one or two examples. You know, the apple fell on many people's heads. Apples have been falling from trees from time immemorial. But not everybody discovered something out of the falling apple. We have Shankaracharya in our culture. He was asked, who are you? Introduce yourself. You know, like our students are asked in an interview. He did not say his name. He gave a beautiful shloka, which you hear, you can hear on YouTube. He said, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. I am that, you know, which is the ultimate. I'm not this body. I'm not this mind. I'm not these emotions. I'm not the guru or the shishya. I'm that eternal, ever-present you know, what we call as cosmic energy, because we are talking scientifically today. Critical thinking, small boy, thinking beyond what is natural, beyond what is normally available to everybody. You know, that is critical thinking. We have to look at things, we have to evaluate them and think whether our evaluation is proper or not. Then we come to problem solving, you know, crisis management, problem solving, all of them are there. Problem solving are, you know, what you do, you give assignments, you give tests, etc. But very often we give very stereotypical. You read the past five years question papers, you can answer the examination. That is not problem solving. Give them something <clears throat> derived from what you have taught, based on what you have taught, but what is not available anywhere inference, you know, reading all that, you know, like an open book system. The material is all in front of you, but nothing is asked from the book. You have to know what is in the book and you have to then write. This is problem solving. Then innovating, thinking about new things. And then of course, lateral thinking. Lateral thinking, I'm sure all of you are doing because in engineering colleges, we have departments which are not comprising of one subject. Like Gladys mentioned her department name. You know, these are all examples of lateral thinking. I cannot go on that now in greater detail, I'm sorry. But as I told you, I, I depend on all of you to tell me many more things which I have never thought of in my entire life. New ideas, experiment, excellent research based on how teaching learning can become excellent. Now we have come to the last slide I wanted to tell you. So one can stand on one's own feet. Education should be such that it can make us totally self-reliant. That is number two. You know, that is why we are going on saying entrepreneurship. Almost every child when I was teaching would say, I want a government job. I want a white collar job. I want a high officer's job. Then when I got a university job, they said, okay, you got a government job, wonderful. Now you stop teaching. A person who has a conscience 
does not stop teaching. 30 years I taught without missing any class till the last day of my retirement also, I was teaching a class. So what we have, self-reliance, not dependence on others, that you know, somebody will help me, somebody will do something for me, standing on our own feet, that is most important. This we don't have. I remember one, you know, very famous professor was giving a lecture. He said, I went to an engineering college and I found all the students were walking with their arms around each other like that, you know, holding each other. Then I asked, are you 70, 80 years old? They said, no, no, we are only very young. We are in our teenagers. They said, why are you holding each other like that and walking? Can't you walk on your own? Can't you walk on your own two feet? We say, oh, our friends, you know, we must put our hands around their shoulders and walk. That is not really what we are looking for. We are looking for self-reliance. I gave you that as a metaphor, but in reality, do we have the courage to depend on ourselves? Nobody will help, no back doors, no recommendations, not all this, but only our own effort, our own capabilities, our own excellences. From this develops self-confidence. You know, at the beginning of the session, I mentioned to you that we have to constantly analyze ourselves. This gives us great self-confidence because our self-worth increases. Of course, self-confidence is a topic which I used to teach for an hour or two, but I have to tell you in a minute or two only. So we need to inculcate this confidence within the student. A student going into the exam hall is full of fear. Why? A well-prepared student should enjoy the exam. They come out of the hall and you ask that, how was your exam? They say, oh, I can't say, I'll wait for the memo. Which means they have no confidence in themselves. We have not been able to instill, we means education. The educationist hasn't been able to instill confidence in this little child who comes to be molded to us. So the parents give birth only to the physical body. The rest of the personality, the rest of the character, the rest of the life is formed by a teacher. That is why we say Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu and so on. Because the teacher is giving real life, not the physical life, not the biological birth. So you can imagine how important it is. So what should a, an excellent teacher or an excellent student have? That is point number three. And these are the capabilities, physical. I find many schools, you know, they have only a few rooms. They don't have a playground. I remember when in school, we had to march past in the whole huge ground. And we had to shout with our own voices, to guide the march past when we were in the senior batch. You can imagine how voice develops, how your muscles develop, how your body becomes strong. Yoga, meditation, all this should become a part of education also. Then physical, mental. I gave you one whole slide about intellectual expansion. Then emotional. You know, today a very important subject is emotional intelligence. I have done many workshops telling people about the importance of emotional intelligence. How much emotion to use? Others also have emotion, respect them. You also have emotion, respect it, and then regulate it. These are important. Then social capabilities. You know, we always seem to think only about ourselves. Myself, my family, my people, my neighbors, my friends, or you know, in a larger context, my city, my state, my country. Not human being, not humanity. So we have to become social beings, universal beings, aesthetic, you know, appreciation, how much we can learn from the world around us. For the first time, locked up at home, we could look at the beauty of the plants and trees. The birds were coming in more in number and singing next to our windows. We had no time because we were rushing around, aesthetic. Ethical, ethical is values, which I spoke about for a long time. And then of course, spiritual. Spiritual would imply 
thinking of something more than this life. This life is not the end. This life is only a process. The product is somewhere else. So this is the process. This is the journey. So this ability, this belief is important. Many people say, oh, scientists don't believe in all this. The greatest scientist of the 20th century, Albert Einstein speaks about science and spirituality. He says that one is lame and the other is blind. One can't walk, another can't see without each other. So they are together. We cannot do without them. You know, socialist Russia was there, which said no religion. Religion is the opium. As soon as the socialism was broken, they demanded, they said, give us, give us, give us, because human beings have that hunger for religion. So we have to remember that spirituality, not religion as we understand today, which fragments us, which tells us, you are not my religion, so I hate you. You are not doing this, so I hate you. No, that is not unification, bringing us all together, making us realize our potential much beyond this physical potential. You know, the Bible says beautifully, dust thou art to dust returnest. But that is only the body. Then what happens to the soul? Longfellow says, dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken for the soul. That is a beautiful poem. It's called The Psalm of Life. You all can read it online. Then we have holistic development. Now, what are we going to call this whole process of excellence? We are going to get knowledge of the core subjects into the students, make them excellent in the subject by inculcating their attention, their interest in all what they are doing, not choosing by saying, I hate this subject, I hate that subject. All are equally important. So all require their attention. Plus the soft skills, what we call life skills, we call by many other names, and that is changing attitudes. You know, our mind is the worst thing. Milton, great poet, used to say that, you know, heaven and hell are made by the mind. The mind in itself makes heaven of hell and hell of heaven, like that he speaks. So behavior also is important. What we think and what we do, what we speak, these are all, you know, thoughts and words and action. So standing on our own feet means being fully balanced. If you have one foot smaller than the other foot, you will always be unsteady. So to ste be steady, we require both feet. What kind of both feet we require? We require hard skills and soft skills. We require capabilities starting from body to everything in, up to the spirit. We require belief in ourselves, not always saying, I'm useless, I'm good for nothing. And then we require also self-dependence, not that, you know, somebody will come and help me. People are very scared to take responsibility. I have seen students saying, why did you join the course? Because my father told me after a few years, I hate my job. Why did you join the job? Oh, my uncle's firm. Then, you know, the child gets married and says, I hate my wife or my husband. Why did you get married? Because they forced me. Nobody is taking responsibility. And that takes away your confidence. That takes away your self-reliance. So many pa such parameters are there for excellence. We ourselves as teachers might find hundreds of more parameters, which I have not mentioned at all. Each of them is like one step towards excellence. By sitting on the ground floor, if I keep thinking, I will go to the first floor or I will go to the fifth floor. Nothing happens. We have to start climbing. Or if there's a lift, we have to take the lift. But at least we have to do that much action. You know, thought is not enough. Thought is not going to take us there. We have to implement. We have to bring it forward. So I feel that if I share excellence, the ideas of excellence with you, each one of you will take it forward in your own way, with your own style and with your own ideas. And then someday you might share it with me, in which case I will also benefit. By your ideas, I will become excellent because I never thought of those ideas myself. So we are learning from each other. By sharing ideas with each other, we are benefiting, we are becoming better. And this, you know, an FTP, the meaning of FTP is too, as UGC gives this nomenclature, I'm sure AICT also gives. That is to refresh and to orient. 
refresh. We know already all these things, but refresh, you know, like we do to our computer, refresh. Orient. We are putting all our energies in different areas. Now give, you know, you build a dam to the river. The river goes in the right way. So to our energies, we give a path. We orient it towards excellence. One way of doing it is to do it very matter of fact, very mechanical, very casual. The other way to do it is to strive for excellence. And excellence is something which you don't achieve. It keeps moving further and further. Today, I feel I'm excellent. Tomorrow, the, that becomes slightly further. Then I have to keep moving towards excellence. Day after I become better, and then I become better. There is no best here. You know, each time you're moving towards best, there is another goal for you. There is another, you know, landmark for you to reach. So thank you very much for listening to me patiently. And now the entire thing is open to all of you.